Welcome, my friends, as we gather for this time of worship. May God's blessing be with us as we enter into worshiping him. May we be joined together through the gift of the Holy Spirit in this time of worship, in this time of praise, in this time of hearing God's word speaking to us. My friends, as we gather for worship, may we lay down our worries and our burdens before the Lord and allow his grace and his mercy to lift us up into a time of blessing, a time of renewal, a time of God's presence filling us. So let us join together as we uh, do, or say together our response of call to worship, which comes from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart and the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty in his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let us join together as we sing one of the favorites of, of many. It is a hymn that was sung at the beginning of the service uh, for many years uh, here at St. Andrews and Arthur. Holy, holy, holy. As we have sung God's praises, as we have sung as the 
cherub, cherubim and seraphim have sung as we read about in the uh, prophet Isaiah chapter 6. Let us also bow our hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who welcomes us and who calls us by name, who knows us inside and out, who knows our fears and our worries, who knows what brings us joy and the deep needs that we won't even admit to ourselves. Lord, you are the God of all creation. You are the God of life and of love. You are the God of blessing. You are the God who reigns over all of us. You are the one who has come to us in Jesus Christ, lifting us up from the, the pit of damnation into the hope and place of heavenly forgiveness and grace. Lord, you are the one who calls us into life and invites us to experience the fullness of life. But Lord, like Isaiah, we recognize our own sinfulness. When we come before you, we are, are astounded by all that we have done that has, has separated us from you. We haven't even realized the half of it. And yet you have called us into relationship with you. You have called us from our place of sin and you have invited us to sin no more. You invited us into a place of redemption, of grace, and of mercy where you wash away our sins. Lord, we cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot build a stairway to heaven. We cannot pave the road to heaven. We need you. We need the redemption and the righteousness of Christ to wash over us that we might be made whole that our brokenness would be healed and that we would be able to truly enter into relationship with you, to be in community with you. Lord, forgive us of our sins. We humbly beseech you. Forgive us for the lies that we have told. Forgive us for our wandering hearts. Forgive us for the idolatry that we have placed in your place in our lives. Help us to walk with you. Help us to be lifted up into the fullness of your grace that we might see you and worship you and know you. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we're introducing uh, something within uh, the context of St. Andrews and Arthur. We're focusing our mission moments on a, on a few different uh, ministries. Uh, within the, one of the uh, within the Presbyterian Church, one with uh, a partner that we've had uh, for a number of years, and one uh, a partnership that we're hoping to develop, uh, working and supporting uh, uh, Medical um, Ministry International. Uh, so we have a couple people from that uh, ministry uh, within the congregation at St. Andrews and Arthur, and we just wanted to honor the work that they're doing and to invite us to develop. Uh, meaningful relationships with our ministry partners. So today we're going to look at uh, some of the work that uh, Medical Ministry International does.
I invite us at this time to join our voices together singing uh, wonderful words or sing them over again to me. Sing them over again to me, wonderful At this time, I invite us to our uh, to take uh, time for our Sunday school um, time. I turn it over to our Sunday school video. Stories of the Bible: Daniel in the Lion's Den. This is Daniel. Oh, hey! Who was a Jewish man who was taken to Babylon when he was very young? Mm hmm. Yeah. Daniel loved God and followed God's rules. He talked to God three times a day and asked God for help often. Daniel served in the Babylonian king's court for many years. Yeah, I know him. And under many kings. Hey, Daniel. Daniel always proved himself to be more capable than all the other court officials. I hear a lot of things. Well, every time. Daniel was serving under King Darius, and because of his great abilities, the king made plans to place him in charge of the entire empire. Wow, okay. The other court officials searched for some fault in Daniel, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. The court officials realized the only way to get at Daniel would be to challenge his faith. Come on! So they went to King Darius. <laughs> Excuse me, your majesty. And advised him to make a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone except King Darius will be thrown into the lion's den. I like it. King Darius signed this law, and once a Babylonian king signed a law, it could not be overruled. When Daniel learned of this law, he went home and knelt down, as he always did, to pray in his room with the windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he always had done, giving thanks to God and asking for his help. The officials went to Daniel's house and found him praying. Gotcha! They went to the king and reminded him of the law. I remember. Well... Then they said that Daniel had been found praying to God three times a day. What? When the king heard this, he was very upset. Get over here. And he spent the whole day trying to think of a way to save Daniel. Wait, what? By that evening, the court officials came back to the king <coughs> and reminded him that no law signed by the Babylonian king 
could be overruled. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. The king said to him, May your God, who you serve faithfully, rescue you. Then the lion's den was sealed shut with Daniel inside. The king spent the night fasting and couldn't sleep. Then very early in the morning, the king hurried to the lion's den. He called out, Hey Daniel! Was your God able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, Long live the king! My God sent his angel to shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be taken out of the lion's den. Then the king ordered the men who had schemed against Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den as punishment. Daniel was safe. There was not a scratch on him, for he trusted in God. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the life that you have given us. We thank you for the lives that you've entrusted into our care. And Lord, as we come before you in worship, as we come before you as your people, help us, Lord, to honor, honor you, to honor the people around us, to keep our focus on you and the work that you have for us. Whether it's ministry in our local area, whether it's ministry around the world, whether it is helping the most vulnerable, or whether it is walking alongside and speaking truth and life in some of the most powerful people. For Lord, we know that all, your, all of our blessings comes from you. All of the opportunities that we have in this life comes from you. Lord, help us to use the time that you have given us wisely, to be good stewards of the resources that you have poured into our lives. Lord, help us to walk in your ways, that others might see you and glorify you. Lord, as we come into your holy presence, we bring to you those people that are on our hearts, the struggles that we ourselves face, the worries of this world. Lord, we pray for, for the many people that are dealing with cancer today, for the treatments that they're having to go through, through the struggles with health and just being optimistic and keeping the faith, for the, to for the people that walk alongside them, tirelessly caring for them, showing your unending love into their presence, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for renewal. We pray for your, for your will to be done. We pray for life to be experienced to the fullest. And Lord, we also lift up to you those who are struggling with where they are right now, with the struggles of, of feelings of purpose, the uneasiness in their hearts, feelings of, of emptiness at times, the, turn, the churning of their spirit. Lord, we pray for your guidance, that you would guide them in the direction that you would have them go, that you draw them closer to you so as they walk together with you, they'll know that no matter where you lead, you are there with them. Lord, we pray for opportunities for ministry, whether it is through the ministry of uh, MMI, whether it's through the ministry of the Caribou uh, Presbyterian Church, whether it's through the ministry of, of that Pastor Malvin is doing down in El Salvador. Lord, we pray that you would continue to open up the doors that need to be opened. Lord, we pray for your blessing on each of the ministries that are going on, the ministries here in, in Arthur, whether it's the, the VBS that's coming up, whether it is uh, the, the food bank that continues to serve uh, people in our community. Lord, we pray for your blessing. 
We pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in people's lives. And Lord, guide us to be your hands and feet. Lord, guide us to continue to work for healing and reconciliation with our indigenous brothers and sisters. Let us not allow what has gone on before to be forgotten. But let us not also stop where we are today, but let us move forward into a relationship that is honoring, a relationship that seeks life and healing. Lord, as we turn to your word, guide us in its reading that we might know you and experience the fullness of your love for each of us today. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture readings today come from uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, and chapter 3, verses 3 to 14, uh, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 to 20, and from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 51 to 58. Then King David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, your, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in my place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And from the Gospel of John, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. 
Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread of the, father, the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, in our, as we go through our lives, as we go through our days, it is important that we speak with wisdom. And yet the question then comes, what is wisdom? How do we discern what is wisdom? How do we define wisdom? When looking back at the scriptures that we have read today, it come, some people say that the wisdom from God from these past times is different than the wisdom that we seek today. Wisdom in the Near East, uh, wisdom throughout the ancient Near East, including Israel, presupposed that the universe operated according to a predictable moral order. Israelites based this on their belief that Yahweh used wisdom in creating the universe. We find that in Proverbs 8, which we'll be reading shortly, and continues to impose justice. This is from the Lexham uh, Bible Dictionary. And we see what Psalm, or, or Proverbs 8 says, starting at verse 22, the Lord formed me from the beginning before he created anything else. I'm talking about wisdom here. I was appointed in ages past, at the very first before the earth began. I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters, before the mountains were formed, before the hills I was born, before he had made the earth and fields and the first handfuls of soil. I was there when he established the heavens, when he drew the horizon on the oceans. I was there when he set the clouds above, when he established springs deep in the earth. I was there when he set the limits of the sea so they would not spread beyond their boundaries. And when he marked off the earth's foundation, I was the architect at his side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence. And how happy I was with the world he created. And I rejoiced with the human family. This is from New Living Translation, Proverbs 8, 22 to 31. So this is describing how wisdom is understood within the Scriptures, that wisdom was present, it was before the creation of the world, and that the creation of the world comes and is intertwined with the wisdom of God. That the wisdom of God is not just uh, separate from creation, but it is part of creation, that God created uh, wisdom and then created the world around us, and there is that relationship. There isn't a separation. There isn't one and the other, but they both work together. And when we look at the deeper meaning of wisdom within the nat- or ancient Near East, uh, understanding wisdom is not just some lofty idea, but it is a way of life, and it is intertwined with creation. That we, to have wisdom is to understand a deeper how to live. It is not a, just about great ideas. It is not just about searching out knowledge. It is about seeking right relationship with God, with the world around us, with each other. So this is where, the, for when we read through um, the Old Testament, this is a prominent focus on how wisdom is understood. Wisdom actually brings us closer to God. It brings us closer to the world around us, which God has placed us into. And it gives us appreciation of life and how to live. When we look a little bit farther into the New Testament, we see hints of this, uh, of the Greek philosophical influence. It is the contrast from skills for living to theoretical speculative wisdom. It is a movement away from that connection with the world around us and with what God has placed in us to trying to understand uh, 
in, way, in the world in very um, theoretical, uh, sort of out there type of uh, ideas. It is more about the idea of thought than about the practice of life. And there's a difference. Yes, the idea, trying to figure out how, to, uh, how to the world works and these great theoretical questions that we can uh, exercise our mind with, sometimes those can be brought into life. But the wisdom that we're looking at in, um, in our scripture reading today from the Old Testament is very much about life and how to live rightly in relationship to God. It is not some uh, far-off idea. It truly is about relationship, about life. So for the Israelites, wisdom was connected to God. It is older than creation, and it is connected with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. When we see and we look at that interconnectedness from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see how uh, the understanding of wisdom is connected Uh, through Scripture, through God's presence. Um, In uh, the Proverbs, we see wisdom almost personified. We see that connection uh, in Jesus Christ, in His teachings. We see the wisdom of God being lived out as it draws people into relationship, as it draws people closer to God. Wisdom is to bring us closer to God. And when we understand the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand God's words, helps us to understand Jesus' teaching, helps us to be able to live life. The Holy Spirit really is um, bringing God's wisdom into our uh, being, how we see the world around us, how we uh, understand God's presence before us. So we see that connection. It's not just the esoteric, the, uh, the ideal, the We are looking off into lofty plains. We're seeing the blood, sweat, and tears of life and how wisdom helps us in that. So wisdom is connecting with God for right living. So we should all be seeking God's wisdom. We should all be seeking how Uh, God is calling us to live, how God is calling us to be in relationship with Him. And this is what uh, Solomon did really well when uh, when God comes to him in the vision, in the dream. Solomon didn't lay down a contract. Solomon humbled himself. He didn't put himself above God. He humbled himself below God and sought God's wisdom and understanding. See, wisdom itself is unchanging, but it is also life-giving. And Solomon is seeking that life-giving wisdom that will help him to lead, help him to live in a life that is honoring to God like his father David did. He sees the example of King David, of his father, and how David, again, bringing in from last week, was a man after God's own heart. How David followed God's statutes. How David followed God's leading in his life. Solomon wants that same wisdom, that same integrity. Solomon also realizes there's a lot of issues with life. As much as David was a man after God's own heart, we also remember that David was also a sinful person. Solomon recognizes his or his own need for God, for God's wisdom to be in a right relationship and to give to others. Wisdom is not to be a game for mental Olympics like we can get to, into sometimes in... Um, and the deep philosophical thoughts. We can go through and read uh, some of the great philosophers that make us think that, is, that can be fun. Believe it or not, that can be quite fun to just get into those deep thoughts. 
but when we come down to it and to our everyday life and how wisdom is to influence us every day, it is to bring us into a deeper relationship with Jesus. It is not to make us uh, couch potatoes of philosophical thought. It is to bring us into active living with Christ and in the world that Christ has given us and into the place where Christ has put us to be the hands and feet of Christ wherever He is leading us. It's not just about thought. That wisdom becomes practice. It comes out in our words and how we live and what we do and how we do it. Solomon at our young age realizes his need for God. He hasn't lived long years and made many mistakes. He's seen lots of mistakes. But he realizes and he submits to God for God's wisdom, not just for his own wisdom, not just for the wisdom of his advisors. He wants that relationship with God and he wants to honor God and he realizes a number of things. He realizes that God has put him in a place. He hasn't earned it. That God is honoring his promise to King David by putting Solomon on the throne. He is, Solomon is also recognizing that the people that he is ruling over are not his people, but they are God's people. This is huge. How many times in our own lives do we see the blessing of God that God has given to us and we forget that it's from God? It becomes ours. And then when it is taken away or when something happens, we feel that we have been harmed in some way, that we have been robbed. And yet, Solomon is seen. These are God's people. This is God's promise that he has been, that he has entered into, that he is honoring God and honoring God's people, honoring this place, this situation in his life that he hasn't earned. He's trying to live up to, try to honor God with this choice. And he submits to God. He submits to the God who from the very beginning has created the world and there is a purpose, there is a reason, there is, uh, there is that, wa- that wisdom that is interconnected in life. He is not putting himself in a place of divinity He's seen the divine hand at work and wants to submit to God. He's not seeing some just crazy ideas that looked really cool. He's seeing the plan of God being lived out. He wants to be part of that. He is seeking God's wisdom. He's seeking God's leading in his life. He is seeking God's blessing for, his, for the people that he has been entrusted with. And he submits. How many of us, when we think about that idea of submitting, do we struggle with it? Do we understand fully the idea? Do we have our idea of wisdom and how it will influence our own lives, how it will influence the world around us? Now, sometimes there is a disconnect. That when we look at the world around us and things just don't seem quite right, there seems to be that disconnect. It seems to be that there are things happening that someone calls wise but seems to be disconnected with the rest of God's creation. That others call wise but counter God's love and God's justice. That others have deemed to be great and the value is disconnected from God. And if we look at where wisdom is coming from and how wisdom is intertwined with creation, that wisdom 
actually helps to direct creation. And in our world around us, where there is that disconnect, there are multiple places of disconnect, we have to wonder, are we submitting to God, to ourselves, or to someone else? Are we seeking the wisdom that God has given to Solomon, to God's people? Are we trying to make up our own wisdom that is separate, that is more in the lofty ideals separate from creation, separate from the world around us, the world that God has placed us in, and in a sense, separate from God. Now, the reality is, is that we live in a world where many people are separating themselves from God, separating themselves from the giver of life, separating themselves from forgiveness and redemption and love and grace separating themselves from the strength that they so desire and putting themselves into a place that they are self-sufficient, self-determinant, outside, that they've turned their backs on what God has blessed us with. We see throughout scriptures how people can turn their backs on God and what can happen. Where people elevate themselves into a place of idolatry and how that will affect not just their own lives but the lives of those around them that it is a disconnect from God's life-giving wisdom, from God's life-giving relationship because we have stopped submitting ourselves to God. Solomon recognizes God's sovereignty over himself and over his people. Do we recognize God's sovereignty over ourselves, over our neighbors, over our community, over our country? Even in a place where we where when we look at the census, the greatest growing uh, faith community is the nuns. No religion, no faith. We see that as part of our reality, as a part of our current uh, existence. But Solomon did not see that. Solomon saw the example of his father, David, who followed God, and he saw God's blessing, and he followed God, and he was willing to submit to God even at a young age. And God was willing to bless him and honor him in that. Solomon wants that deep relationship with God. He doesn't just want something that's shallow, something that is uh, just filled with blessing and comfort. He isn't just looking for riches so that he won't have to worry about anything. He doesn't want... He doesn't just want to be able to conquer all of his enemies so there will be peace, sort of. Because we know when you conquer someone, eventually they try to conquer back. When you have riches and comfort for a while, it doesn't last. It either disappears or someone comes to take it. He is seeking the deepest blessing that cannot be taken from anyone, that relationship with God. Wealth can disappear. Power can be taken away. But your relationship with God is eternal. As long as we are willing to honor it. As long as we are willing to continue to invest in it as God invests it invest in us. The wisdom that Solomon is seeking is a relationship that is infused with God's life. When we think about how wisdom is uh, intertwined in creation, how wisdom and creation bring life into being as we see the life that 
God spoke into creation as we see the life that God redeems through Jesus Christ. It is deeply connected with God, not just with earthly pleasures. Too often we think of blessings as, and we focus on the earthly pleasures and we forget about the one who's blessing us. We forget about the one whose life he has breathed into us. That it is not just about comfort and riches and pleasure. It is about life. It is about thriving in life. Being able to flourish in life. A life that is filled with God. A life that is filled with the power of creation and of redemption. A life that is beyond rich, riches and pleasure and power. A life that continues to bring life. A life that is tied up in relationship and constantly honoring and blessing. The problem is we sometimes get lost in seeking the wisdom of God and we see something that looks good that actually leads us farther away from God. So what wisdom are you looking for? Are you looking for the wisdom that Solomon was looking for that brings life, that brings relationship, that brings hope? Are you looking for wisdom that leads us in a different direction? A wisdom that is more about knowledge than how to use the knowledge. Maybe you want to be wise to sidestep some pitfalls at work or at home. Maybe you want to be wise to get ahead in life. Maybe you want to be wise to resist temptation. Wisdom is not supposed to be just about you, though. It is to be part of a growing relationship with God, you and those around you. It is about community. It is not just about yourself uh, and grandment. It's not about your grandeur. It is not about your glorification. It is about that interconnectedness that God has given us, that has called us to. It is about seeing God's hand at work and trusting in the order that God has placed in this creation, in our lives. Benefits of wisdom nurture God's kingdom, not just our own little corner of it. If we're just looking at trying to make peace in our little corner of it, we are missing the point. We are missing what God really wants us to be doing, to see the interconnectedness of God's kingdom, of God's work in this creation, in the world around us, through our brothers and sisters, that we may know and those that we don't know. It is not just about us. And here's the, a quote from Isaac Asimov. He's a science fiction writer. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. He's not saying that science is bad. He's not saying that uh, we shouldn't be seeking knowledge. But with all the knowledge that we can seek, we also need to be, to be able to seek wisdom. Because we can have all sorts of knowledge. But if we don't have the wisdom to be able to use that knowledge, we are going to hurt ourselves, we are going to hurt others. We are going to make things worse. And it's very insightful because we seek knowledge. But do we seek the wisdom to use that knowledge? Do we see ourselves as having more knowledge and be having more power? Or do we see ourselves as humbling ourselves before the Lord? 
Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you'll be the one to suffer. That's from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 to 12. Do we seek to create our own wisdom that is separate from the wisdom that is instilled from God in creation? He's inviting us to be part of and to know. Are we seeking our own wisdom so that we don't have to submit to God? Because then we don't have to be reliant on God. Are we seeking to humble ourselves before the Lord to fear God and reverence Him with our whole being, knowing that no matter what we face in this life, God is there. That God has the power to bring us through. That God will never leave us or forsake us. Because Jesus has promised that. Do we trust in the promises of God or do we trust in the promises of ourselves? Even though our track record, let's be honest here, is nothing compared to God's. How many times have we failed just ourselves, let alone someone else? And How many times has God been there, even when we won't admit it? That when we look back, we see that He was there with us in those times of struggle, those times of trial, those times of pain and suffering, and He was still loving us. My friends, God loves you today, as He did yesterday, as He will tomorrow. Jesus came to earth to remind us of that great love, to show us that great love, to invite us and to speak His words of truth, of His words of wisdom into our lives, that we would follow Him, that we would be redeemed in Him, that our sins would be washed away, and that the promise of God would be realized in our own lives. What wisdom are you seeking? Are you willing to speak the wisdom of God or only your own? We speak the wisdom that is unchanging, that is life-giving, that draws us into relationship. Or will you seek your own wisdom, which doesn't always connect, doesn't always make sense, doesn't always bring life. My friends, let us choose the wisdom of God. Let us choose to walk with God. Let us choose the life that God has for us, to not be afraid, to not be sidestepped, but to grow and to know we are not alone, that we are with God, and that God loves us. Let us join together in song singing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Here of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of on my side, angels descending, bring from above, those of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect 
submission was at rest. I hid my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Lord Jesus, your word assures us of your faithfulness, of your providence, of your blessing. Lord, we struggle at times to follow in your ways. Help us to be like Solomon in submitting to you to seek your wisdom, that it is not about our ways, but it is about how you are calling us to live in the world that you have created. It is not about lofty ideas and ideals. It is about life. It is about your love. It is about bringing us closer to you and to each other, to creating community that blesses all people. Lord, we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Trust and Obey. In the light of His Word, and glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide where we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy and Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Here we go today, walking with the wisdom of God who leads us in life, 
who entrusts his words to us, who entrusts his Holy Spirit, that we might see the fullness of life, that we might be able to bless others as he has blessed us. May we go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. I invite us to join together as we sing, Go in Love. My friends, may we go from this time of worship into the work that God has for us. May we share his blessings. May we live in his wisdom. May we flourish in his love. Until next time, my friends, may we be at peace with God, with each other, and with yourselves. Amen.